This time on the Peter Von Gom Japan channel, we're headed to Kobe, Japan. Not for Kobe beef, but for the cows. We'll take a tour of the Kawasaki Motorcycle Museum. But first, this weirdly unique Japanese product. Now, we all know that Japan has some really weird stuff, and some of the drinks they come up with are no exception. Beer tastes water. Who comes up with this stuff? They recommend it for lunchtime, meetings, and sports. Let's give it a try. Ooh, it actually does have a beer smell. Mmm, it's a stretch. It's a little bit lemon-lime with a tinge of beer flavor. Hmm, how would this taste in a martini? It's the all-time, all-free beer taste martini test. Bathtub gin. Beer taste. And what would a martini be without an olive? Cole's anus. Did I get that name right? There you have it, folks. Cheers. Oh my god, it's actually pretty good. All right, we got a train to catch. So we're on a bullet train, tearing down to Hiroshima at average speeds of 320 kilometers an hour. It's not even as fast as the fastest Kawasaki motorcycle in production. Imagine that. Incidentally, this bullet train is also a Kawasaki product. First stop, Kobe, for a visit to the Kawasaki Good Times World Motorcycle Museum. You can feel the Kawasaki pride of the Kobe people. My excitement began to spill over when my taxi driver told me he was a former employee at the Kawasaki plant, and he used to race for Team Kawasaki. Okay, I just made that last bit up. But he did own and ride an early 1970s cow. Driver san wa nan no bike ano katte desu ka? Kawasaki. Back in the day, I had a Kawasaki Mach 3, 753 bend. Green and fast as f The H2, one of the first superbikes. H2, okay. <laughs> no, no, the old lady made me get rid of it. <laughs> Second dumbest thing I ever did. Well, I hate to break the news to you, Oji-san, but the Mach 3 was a 500cc bike. Not 750. What you had was a Mach 4. Now you can't trust either of us. Arriving at the port of Kobe, it's impossible to miss the Kobe port tower. From its observatory, spectacular views of the port of Kobe, and also the Kawasaki Heavy Industries factory. This is where your ninjas and other bikes are assembled and shipped out around the world. This is also where jet skis, tunnel boring machines, helicopters, bullet trains, ships, and industrial robots are made, to name a few. Oh, and hyperbaric chambers. That's right, just like the one the King of Pop used to count sheep and chimpanzees in. <laughs> but most of the world knows Kawasaki for these machines. And there's a load of them right down there in that origami-inspired museum. Let's go milk some cows. Ooh. Welcome to the Kawasaki Good Times world. Why don't we kick things off with my birth year? and with a bike that was considered the king of superbikes for its generation. This is the Avenger A7 from 1968. Oh, what a year that was. Not just for the world, but for the world of motorcycles. We set a displacement of about 340 and put out uh, about 40 horsepower. And here it is, the Mach 4, the Nana Han 750. This was the successor to the Mach 3, go figure. This was introduced in 1971, and the very model that our cab driver was talking about. Two-stroke, 74 horse, he had this bike. So the Mach 3 was a 500cc, and that came out in the late 60s. And that was the bike that really put Kawasaki on the map. Really the first production bike that had any weight for the Kawasaki brand. Oh, sweet. This is the A7RS from 1969. And in Singapore, this bike came in first and second place at the Singapore GP. And about this time is when this Kawasaki Green started to show up on the scene. 
and people did not know what to think of it. And this is the first H2R, 1972. Look at that green. This was raced in Daytona, 1972. And because these things wanted to wheelie when they're flying down the track, they fitted this model with some kind of stabilization in the fairing to help keep it stabilized and preventing those wheelies. So this Kawasaki Green, in Japan, they call it the Hangyaku Green, which means like the rebellious green, the opposite. So green in Japan is kind of a, an auspicious color. It's good luck. But when they were going to Daytona, green in the West has a different meaning. So they figured, we'll throw them off their feet by introducing this radical color, and it worked. Here's the 1982 KZ-1000R. So interestingly, this was developed to commemorate Eddie Lawson, who became the AMA Superbike Champion in 1981, riding the KZ-1000J. This has the bikini fairing and step seat and also has this Kirker megaphone exhaust. So this is the KZ-1000S, which looks pretty much like the 1000R, but most of the engine and body parts are quite different. This was a racing production model. This is the 1982 KR500. It was ridden by Cork Ballington in the World Grand Prix. It's not gonna win any beauty contests, but it worked very well for Kawasaki in the 82 WGP 500. In 1993, this ZXR7 took Team Kawasaki to win the Suzuka 8 Hours. And interestingly, they developed this based on results from previous race data. Now in 1993, based on the ZXR7 racing model, they developed the ZXR750. Has the E-Box twin tube frame. That's gorgeous. This is the KX450F 2014. That was ridden by Ryan Villapato in the AMA Supercross. And he actually won on this actual bike between 2011 and 2014. This one was used in the 2014 season. Obviously, they've cleaned it up a bit. Here we have the Ninja ZX-10R from 2015. This was ridden by Jonathan Ray in the Superbike World Championship, and he dominated the scene with an overwhelming number of wins. You couldn't keep the guy off the podium. This is the GPZ 1000 RX from 1988. Top speed, about 260 kilometers an hour. Not too shabby. As a favor to tandem riders, they have these storable grips that go right here. This is actually an 88 model, but the first one went on sale in 1985. This is the Ninja ZX 11 a.k.a. the ZZR1100. This came out in 1990, and it is a beast. This was the first bike to have a speedometer that reached 320 kilometers an hour. Talk about temptation, as if some kid's not gonna try to peg it at that. It's also got the Ram Air induction bottom of the fairing here. This is the ZX12R from 2000. Look at that. That rear pipe is just menacing. Look at the size of that thing. And here it is, the 1984 Ninja. This predates the Ninja Green. It wasn't until the late 80s, 88, 89, before we saw the Ninja with that Kawasaki Green. 
this green monster is the Ninja ZX-14R from 2012. And it has the largest engine in the history of the Ninja line. 1,441 cc's. What a beast. The flushed lights were kind of a new style. And also plenty of space to tuck your head down when you're flying down the road. This green is amazing. It's Kawasaki trivia time. What bike kicked the Suzuki Hayabusa to the curb to become the world's fastest production motorcycle? That's right, the Ninja H2. It sports a supercharged four-cylinder power plant that generates up to 300 horse, more with ram air and a pants crapping top speed of 400 kilometers an hour. That's nearly 250 miles per hour for you kids in America. Will man's quest for speed ever end? Never. As we wrap things up here at the Kawasaki Good Times World, I wanted to save my all-time favorite Kawasaki for last. And although there are a load of awesome Kawasaki's, this, in my opinion, is the quintessential. It's a timeless classic. In 1972, after the Mach 3 hit and Kawasaki started to make a name for themselves, they smacked another homer with this bad boy. The Z1 changed the world's thoughts on Kawasaki. Well, thanks so much for joining me for this tour of the Kawasaki Motorcycle Museum in Kobe at Kawasaki Good Times World. I had a blast. For more videos like this, be sure and subscribe to the channel. Click that notification bell and stay tuned for some great shows coming up, including this. We ride with one of the hottest up and coming racers in Japan. Kawasaki, let the good times run!